uh, being a member of the public. You know, and that's a really interesting distinction, like, like poetry, public. Like, who are we? You know, are, are we not sort of part of that populace? Despite the fact that we are also committed to standing back and observing it. I went into a pet store a few years ago in Salt Lake City where a new shipment of goldfish had arrived. They were in a big plastic bag. And I found myself uh, incapable of not describing <laughs> this bag. Uh, the, the, the name of the store, I swear, lends the poem its title. It's called Fish Are Us. <laughs> Clear sack of coppery eyebrows suspended in amnion, not one moving. A Mars composed entirely of single lips, each of them gleaming. This bag of fish, have they really traveled here like this? Bulges while they acclimate, presumably, to the new terms of the big tech at Fish Are Us. Soon they'll swim out into separate waters. But for now, they're shoulder to shoulder in this clear and burnished orb, each fry about the size of this line, too many lines for any bronzy antique epic, a million of them, a billion incipient citizens of a goldfish Beijing, a Sao Paulo, a Mexico City. They seem to have sense not to move, but hang fire, suspended held at just a bit of distance, a bit is all there is, all facing outward, eyes they can't even blink, turn toward the skin of the sack they're in, this swollen polyethylene. And though nothing's rippling but their gills, it's still like looking up into falling snow, if all the flakes were a dull, breathing gold, as if they were streaming toward, not us exactly, but what they'll be. Perhaps they're small enough, live sparks for sale at a nickel apiece that one can actually see them transpiring. They want to swim forward, want to eat, want to take place. Who's going to know or number or even see them all? They pulse in their golden ball. Now, I'll end with a poem that was um, composed under, under sort of odd circumstances. This was a commissioned poem. Um, the New York Times asked a number of poets to um, write something in response to the anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. And, and well, being happy to have a, an assignment, I said, sure. And then I tried to write the poem. And I tried to write the poem. I had never been to Berlin. I'd never seen the Berlin Wall. My knowledge of it uh, is entirely mediated. And this is, in fact, one of the great struggles for American poets attempting to address what we would conventionally think of as political life. You know, if your poetry is founded in perception, in subjective engagement with the world, and the evidence that your senses provide to you, how do you talk about things that you're not present for? And yet those things for which we are not present so thoroughly shape us all. Well, I was honestly about ready to call up and um, resign my commission when I saw some photographs that changed my mind. Uh, you know the, the beautiful, um, well, not conventionally beautiful, but really intriguing um, walls that people, workers, put up around uh, construction sites in Manhattan, buildings being gutted or, or under construction, and how complex those walls become. My friend John Masterson took some extraordinary photographs of them. The lesson. Some workers put up a wall on 25th Street, plywood sheathing a frame of two by fours, to seal the building they'd gut and remake. Then they added layers, stacks of metal pipe bound with black webbing, a layer of permits, photocopied signatures far removed from whatever hand inscribed them. Then a blue expanding ladder, hydraulic, squatting on its haunches. My friend John took pictures of the whole unlikely and elaborate composition, barrier and palimpsest, warning and advertisement. How could you not look at it with its tears and concealments? And though such photos might aestheticize, allowing us to stand at a distance from the wreck of things, I think his do something else. In this way, I began to look at walls, decaled plexi between my face and the back of the cab driver's head. Blue shroud on 16th, like the robe of Venus rippling over the entry of Pottery Barn. 
the insidious barrier. Who could put their hands on it, dividing me and the dark young men under the scaffolding on my corner, smoking by the door of the technical school? All going back somehow to the story one of my teachers told, voice slipping to a register we'd never heard in our room's calm rose. How a lover, desperate to reach the beloved on the other side, strapped himself to the underside of a car, face pressed up into the metal, the back of his head inches above the pavement. How he'd tried to refuse, with his own body at least, the sundering of his city. Did he live? Did he ever arrive? I remember only my teacher beginning to weep. And we children, in our low-slung school building in Tucson, the desert freshly scraped to make way for us, we didn't understand. What was the lesson? John's pictures brought that back. And how, decades later, the night they first scaled the wall, the people at the top reached down to pull up the others and shouted, come on, come on. When the guards turned the water cannons on them, they sprayed back from open bottles of champagne. Then the broken chunks appeared in the hands of those who had loosened them. Fragments of concrete glazed with spray paint, scarred with sledgehammer and chisel. Instruments of union, a demanding beauty about them. Whatever was scrawled, perhaps, re perhaps capable of realigning. As words, in what language? Something barely spoken yet. Thank you. Hi. How are you? All right. I was just thinking we're quite a crew. Uh, Mark, who I'm very happy to see, uh, up and about and well, so I have surgery. I'm in the throes of Bell's palsy. Okay, so if I start to go too fast and you can't <laughs> do that, uh, but I think I'll be okay. Uh, it's interesting that uh, Mark mentioned Berlin. It was because I was sitting there thinking about it and I thought, what a segue. Uh, I was, there was a, a sort of a poetry tour not long ago where they put a group of poets on a train in Germany and they went from town square to town square. And they pull into the square and the vans would be playing and they'd let people off the train and they would read poetry in the square, and then they get back on, and they go to the next town. And I was in Berlin at the end of this tour where everyone came back home, um, and there were so many people in the train station that they had to close the Berlin train station down. They opened the doors, and they had to pass the poets over the heads of the people, and people had placards and banners and there was weeping and I thought the idea that I might at some time in my life have something to say that people will look forward to with that much anticipation you know it was like this is where the truth tellers were so somewhere between there and the poems I'm writing now and this is where uh, the question of politics comes in I started out writing poems as a recreational activity. It was fun. It was where my social circle was. I thought, this is great. Look at these audiences. Look at this music. Look at this fire. Look at this heat. Look at this motion. And somewhere along the line, it now becomes pretty much the only way I have to establish my own emotional and political root because I did not get that from my family. My parents were from the South, what, ashamed of being from the South? So they never told me what my root was. So now I find that my poetry is basically the only way I have of establishing in a lot of ways who I am. So between making that grand pronouncement and finding out where I stand in the world, that's where my poetry works, in there. Um, so I'm, I'm still gradually uncovering things in my work. Um, 
and trying to figure out if I'm part of a public, I mean, I wasn't for a long time because there was a, a, a chasm between the so-called, you know, people who were doing, I guess for lack of a better term, performance poetry and established academic poetry. So we felt like rebels, but a lot of that was fright. And uh, I always wanted to think that there was one collective voice. And the longer I examined the community, and the more I met people who I thought were beforehand inaccessible. Honestly, I just thought, oh, Mark Doty, you're kidding me, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and then realize that you know we're, we're starting, a lot of us are starting on the same page, and that we have a lot of the same concerns, and maybe the stanzas that I use to get there are different from the stanzas he uses to get there. But I love the idea of one public poetic voice, and I decided at this moment right now that that's what I'm going to hear too, so okay. That's what we're doing. Uh, this is my first reading since this, so I'm, I'm working on it. Uh, I'm going to uh, read a poem. Um, my, my racial identity is undergoing a bit of a change uh, as I discover some things from my early life uh, with the help of my not to, uh, my mother's not cooperating very much, but I'll, I'll shake it out of her. Um, okay. Anyway, I'm from Chicago originally, and um, there's a amusement park in Chicago. It's no longer there. It's called, was called Riverview Park. And there was a midway, and my father would only always take me so far on the midway but no farther. And I couldn't figure out why he was doing that. Uh, and I didn't find out until I was researching my current book why uh, that was. So this is called Laugh Your Troubles Away, which was the motto of Riverview Park. Every city had one, a palace with a fried tint to its air, a hurting huge screech of no underneath, everything plummeting or ascending, a monument to hazy flailing and sudden fun vomit. Swing the Riviera onto Belmont and you see the parachutes rising to heaven on dual strings, headed for the pinpoint and release, then the sick whip and fall the public little murder, a blaring grace so storybook gorgeous, suddenly blood in the throat. Revelers board creaking fireball cars and slice the August, mistaking acid bubbling in their bellies, this is hard, <laughs> for symptoms of glee, then stop to stuff quavering guts with plastic and syrup. Their quick sustenance has wafted all day on a river of grease. They hunger for white cakes curled stiff with sugar, sausages that pop huge heat, pink candy of cotton chomping rot down their throats. The jagged stains of compromised fruit circle screaming mouths and faint shadow across the teeth, making them horrible. Bulbs flash. Wet Polaroids are lifted and waved like church fans to etch and clarify in the summer steam. The aged horses are dizzied and diseased. Chained to a tilting stake, they blur through the drag, deferring to their brutal, squirming burdens. Pot-bellied flies, nasty to the point of charm, nibble passages toward the horses' blue hearts. Above it all, the freak show MC, his shout, an odd mixture of pity and sex, dares us to witness sweaty sloth, tiny floating corpses, so much skin unlike ours, more legs than allowed, and a Negro who can separate himself from his eyes. 